Hey. How are you? Okay, you. Good. Okay, I trust you found a, uh, a pew without a sliver, otherwise I would be hearing from you by now. And do we have any announcements or shouts of joy? Or, yes, Carol. It's time for Carrie and Sherry again next Sunday, and there are some lists around, laying around, where there's a list in the big blue tub back there. Um, so, just once again, I'm carrying and sharing a board, and everyone involved in that, so everyone wants to thank all of you for being very generous. And there are other lists up here uh, if you feel you want to uh, contribute more than what you already contribute. I believe the scripture reading is blank as of yesterday anyway from uh, after today. So sign up for scripture reading if that is something you would like to do. And there's uh, cleaning uh, clean to the glory of God, all things to his glory, uh, snacks, and a lot of lists over there that uh, need filling. So, any other announcements or... Okay. When I was a kid, the uh, one of the most favorite times was show and tell for me, and uh, I didn't do so well in the other classes, but uh, I have a little show and tell for you here, uh, that rattles, but if you haven't wandered downstairs in a while, and if you wonder how buildings are heated. They're heated by furnaces, and you should go down there because the furnaces are installed, the new ductwork is installed. And I walked in there the other day, and Bill was working diligently, and underneath the concrete of the furnaces, he had pointed something out to me, and he dug and dug and pulled, and we have a lot of pieces, but we probably found uh, maybe the culprit as to why this burned down in 1906, <laughs> because there were very differing stories as to how the church burned down in 1906, uh, one of which these Presbyterians... I'm sure out of, and we'll see this in the text today, trying to do good, hired some people that maybe some would think were not the most wholesome people in the world. Um, and they dilly-dallied, and they were given an ultimatum. You get the work done, or you leave. And someone said they left. And poured some stuff and struck, struck a match and burned the place down. Uh, this may be evidence of such behavior. I don't know if it is uh, maybe a medicine bottle of some kind, but it was underneath the concrete, and the concrete was busted up, and, and Bill has found this. So 
I thought you may be interested in maybe having solved a deep mystery here. Uh, so there, now on to other things. Um, okay, well... <sighs> Okay, now, terrible, how terrible things are. We are going to be singing another hymn that we sang last week, and if you're like me, the word terrible was terrible, and I had a little joke saying that, oh, we're singing this hymn that said, terrible God, it must be a misprint. Well, it wasn't a misprint, and I was kind of playing you. Uh, it does say terrible God, and we're going to sing that before the sermon today. But Herb showed me something that was very interesting. Uh, he gave me a dictionary uh, picture of a 1828 dictionary of the word terrible. And then I looked up the word terrible in a regular dictionary. And so here's the regular dictionary. You have uh, uh, dreadful, awful, appalling, horrific, horrifying, horrible, horrendous, atrocious, abominable, deplorable, egregious, abhorrent, frightful, shocking, and I think you get the drift. Terrible is terrible. It is just terrible. Well, in the Webster Dictionary of 1828, an interesting little cultural shift. Uh, we have frightful, adapted to excite terror, dreadful, formidable. And we heard this morning in Bible study that Becky was a part of some athletic group called the Terrible Swedes. And I'm Swedish and we're not terrible, but it's a different kind of terrible. The Vikings were their mascot and they were to create terror in those whom they encountered. So formidable, prudent in peace, Terrible in war. Definition two, adapted to impress dread, terror, or solemn awe and reverence. Absent from our current dictionary. All terrible terribles in current dictionary. But in 1828, terrible could be that God who is other, and yet 
also that terribleness striking awe and reverence. Now, how can that be? Well, current definitions and usage is that terrible is terrible from every which way. And we know that God is not terrible in that sense. But he is the God of all. And he has being in himself. And that otherness that he alone possesses is and strikes a certain terror in his creation that properly digested, creates reverence and holy fear. Okay? And they cite verses in a dictionary where there's a separation between church and state. Okay? Daniel 2.31, the form of the image was terrible. Deuteronomy 7.21, the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God and terrible. Okay, again, not morally terrible, but terrible in terms of his transcendence, in terms of his otherness, his separateness. And then Psalm 99, 3, let them praise thy great and terrible name. Why? Because he is holy and other. You see, we've lost that. One of a uh, theologian that I've followed for many years wrote a book called, now get this, The Domestication of God. So when you domesticate a wild animal, we uh, apparently back in time domesticated the dog. Okay, and what he was saying in this book is that we have domesticated the transcendent otherness of God and made him in a true but skewed way, we focused on his chumminess, his friendliness, and his, our brother. All of that's true. He is a friend. He is our brother. But he's also the God who stands above all that is. And in his book, The Domestication of God, he says Christendom has tamed God and has retained only that which makes us feel good. And therefore, something ironic has happened. In trying to make God more palatable, digestible, and user-friendly, we've stripped him of his magnanimous otherness, and now he's kind of uninteresting. Who's God? He's the big love buddy. He's the guy who does all good. He's our, you know, whatever. Don't really need him. May the force be with you. No worry about accountability. No worry about judgment. We've stripped him of this otherness. And so, anyway, an interesting journey in time. Well, we're here to glorify, not merely our brother, not merely our friend, but we're here to glorify that God who strikes terror in our hearts because he is that grand other that grounds everything that is, that's responsible for the myriad of universes and a time travel that really just boggles the human brain. So let's do that. Let's stand in his presence and sing that which is on your screen. We will glorify the King of Kings, the Lamb.
glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven and Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the Great I Am. Please be seated and in spirit, please join me as we ask this holy, terrible God to be with us. Heavenly Father, the terrible God, terrible Lord because you are holy, terrible Lord because your thoughts are higher than all of our thoughts, Terrible because you reign supreme as Lord Sovereign and will not share your glory. Yes, terrible. And yet in your terribleness, Lord, in your untouchableness in a certain way, you have promised to be here among us and you are in us because we are your templed presence here on earth in that intimate groom, bride, lovely sense of the term. So your bride gathers and your bride is here to receive the overtures of the groom our brother, our king, our Lord. This indeed is a very special place, not because of these walls, but because of your promised and abiding presence through your Son. We tremble. And yet we rejoice, we are fearful, and yet, Lord, we find rest in your presence. Help us, Lord, to truly worship you and honor you and receive from you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We'll have a moment of prayerful reflection Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, your Son's work of redemption is finished. Seated at your right hand, your Son now rules and reigns. Your people are indwelt with your very presence, making us your true sanctuary and temple. Your Spirit has come to renew and empower 
so that we may live a life of consecration and devotion to the one true and living God. Though he has come, we confess our lack of response, our hardness of heart, and we bear witness to our own resistance to his rule and reign, both in our hearts and in the world. Therefore, we call upon you, O God, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And yes, it's okay to skip a line and bumble through it, because it's not just the words that we say, but it is the heart with which we say them. And FYI, in case you guys are not liturgically ground, which I wasn't either, and I'm still not, this is the last Sunday for, there's three years in the liturgical calendar, A, B, and C. We are in the last Sunday of A, I believe, and we're making a transition into year B, starting with Advent next Sunday. We've been in the last season of A, which is Pentecost, and the giving of the Spirit. And that's why this prayer is, is structured in that way. That's why we say in this prayer, your spirit has come to renew and empower. Because Pentecost, which is in all three years, Pentecost is the celebration of the disciples under Jesus' instruction of waiting of waiting for the arrival of the Spirit. And so we confess during Pentecost, your Spirit has come to renew and empower so that we may live a life of consecration and devotion. And yet, Lord, we also feel in our own bones and flesh resistance to your rule and reign. Now, these are just small T traditions. They're not big T apostolic traditions, this calendar year. But it's nice because it's the rhythm of Christ coming, Christ living, Christ dying, Christ ascending, and Christ sending his spirit. That's the glory of the church calendar, and we will ride it high on any wave that we can. So say goodbye to your calendar A, and we will be leaving Pentecost and walking into Advent, which is uh, an awaiting, an anticipation of Jesus the Christ. In light of all of that, now comes this public declaration, which I have been so blessed to be your pastor. Lane just did a paper on John Calvin and passed with flying colors. He didn't even need to give the teacher an apple to get an A. And uh, Calvin, however, had a reputation, and Lane knows this, of, of ruling with an iron hand and the secular historians really focus on Calvin's autocratic rule. Well, if he's autocratic, I'm God incarnate, because Calvin wanted public repentance and public proclamation of forgiveness, and the consistory in Geneva would not let him have it. And you've been so gracious to allow the freedom of my understanding of what should happen in worship to have this. And I, I hope you come to these moments in a spirit of worship. And now, what Calvin never had in Geneva, I with great delight can give you and do. Dear Bride of Christ, dear Bethlehem of God, dear Torrington, Fort Laramie, Laramie, and who and wherever you are from, no longer must you live in shadows of denial and brokenness. No longer must you play games with your conscience. Rather, hear and believe the gospel. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting your trespasses against you. 
For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Please stand with me and let's sing again. uh, Number, not sing again, well, yeah, I guess so. Uh, Number 62, not the same song, however. Number 62, shine, Jesus, shine. Shining Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us, set us free by the truth you reign us, shine on me, shine on me, shine Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory, blaze, Spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. I come to your awesome presence From the shadows into your radiance By thy blood I'm into brightness Search me, try me, consume my darkness Shine on me, shine on me Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. As we gaze on your kingly brightness, so our faces display your likeness. Gene from glory to glory, mere your lay our lives tell your story. Shine on me, shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Father's glory, blaze, spirit, blaze. Our hearts on fire. O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. His hand are the depths of the earth, as the mountains are all. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord God. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, 
is now and ever shall be world without end Amen Amen Please be seated and we'll have the reading of God's holy word which is printed in your bulletin if you want to follow along Thanks be to God. Second reading of Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit spirit of wisdom and the revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The gospel reading is found in Matthew's gospel, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you, or thirsty and gave you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothed you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So ends the reading of God's word. Okay, let us now turn to that terrible hymn about a terrible God, and let's sing with a new understanding of that adjective, terrible. Number 30. Terrible God that reigns on high, How awful is thy thundering hand, thy fiery bolts, how fierce they fly, nor can all earth or hell withstand. This is the rebel angels knew, and Satan fell beneath thy frown. Thine arrow struck the traitor through, and weighty vengeance sunk him down. This Sodom felt and feels it still, and roars beneath eternal load. With endless burnings who can dwell? or bear the fury of a god. Tremble, ye sinners, and submit. Throw down your arms before the throne. Bend your heads low beneath his feet, or his strong hand shall crush you down. Bless ye saints and love him too. With reverence, how be holy saints. The soldiers, every servant, do. 
is a bright and burning flame. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> well, well, well. Aha. I have found it. Okay. So, the readings are dovetailed together under a seeking shepherd and a shepherd that distinguishes between sheep and goats and the great final judgment of the world. Now, in case you haven't had the opportunity to be here, uh, we need to review something. In Matthew, I believe it's chapter 24, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when these things be. When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? Okay? The close of the age is when God stops his seeking shepherd activity, and then he puts on his warrior lamb garb, and he comes to mete out justice and to gift his mercy in a final sense in which the parallel words, worlds of saints and sinners are no more. Everything that humanity, if they began writing exactly what happened from day one or, or close to that, every day the sun rises and sets and everything goes on as it does. But that's not going to be the case because this age where believers and unbelievers reside together, that's an age that is coming to pass one final day, and it will be over. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. Now that's kind of an imperative. That is a kind of a command. It's an exhortation. So how are you going to see that no one leads you astray. How are you going to do that? That's what Jesus told them. As he gathered his disciples, they, they gathered together privately and asked him about what the signs were and when he was coming back. Well, I believe the last few weeks have given us a glimpse as to how we can make sure and see that no one deceives us. Okay, last week, uh, so, Matthew 24, 36 through 51, Noah, thieves, and servants, and Jesus returns in this parable suddenly and quickly. So, Jesus says to his disciples, so that no one leads you astray, it could be soon, Therefore, be ready or face judgment. Each one of these rollouts has a phrase, a middle portion, and the lesson of final judgment that should move us to not fall prey to error. Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, bridesmaids and lamp oil, it could be delayed, therefore persevere or face the judgment. You see, this is the futility of trying to point to a time uh, in which you think you know when Jesus comes back again. Here in these two separate parables, in principle, he's telling his disciples, it could be soon, get ready. It could be delayed, persevere. 
You see that? So if you were to go back, make sure no one leads you astray, now Jesus begins to roll out how you cannot be led astray. Get ready. Now. It could happen soon. It could be delayed. And therefore, beg to God for perseverance. If you do not, you will face judgment. Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. Talents, investments, and risk-taking. The kingdom makes demands on you. Give it your all or face judgment. You see the talents. He was given five. When the Lord and the servant, when, when the Lord and the master returned, that one who gave, was given five, returned the five and gave him five more. To the one who was given two, he returned the two and gave him two more. To the one who was given one, he returned the one because he was fearful of the master. The lesson there is you have to be a risk taker. You have to throw everything you have into it or face judgment. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. Now sheep, goats, and works. Lesson here. To be my disciple, it will cost you. Do works of mercy or face judgment. Now, how is it that Jesus throws out these four demands and imperatives that seem to cost us everything that seemed to demand our all and then threaten us if we don't judgment 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 and judgment how does that prepare anyone to not fall prey to error I mean it causes terror how does that become a motivation. Well, we looked at the motivation several weeks prior. You can go on our website, Vimeo or YouTube or Facebook, and you can watch these messages as we pull out grace from each of those exhortations. But I wanted to give you that fourfold rollout to alert you to the demands of God, to the demands of God in terms of giving everything, to the demands of God in terms of doing works, to the demands of God, and even the threats if you don't do them. Because this is the Lord through Matthew telling us how we can not be led astray. There's something in there for us so that we will not be led astray. So let's take a look at that. Matthew chapter 25. First, let's note in James, when he says, if you say, I have faith, with no works, that's empty. I will show you my faith by my works. And then he rhetorically asks regarding the faith that has no works, can that faith save him? Well, you know, Protestants and Catholics differ on this very phraseology. Faith plus works, or faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. And some have said that James and Paul are unreconcilable, and indeed it gave problems for Luther. And Luther called James at one point an epistle of straw, though he kept it, and he preached from it, and he gleaned from it, I think, what God wanted him to glean. But, but there's no 
explicit reference to Christ, and that concerned Luther. But we have to remember when James says, can that faith save him? James is talking about that faith that merely is a formality of saying, I believe in some information, and then go out and not have a heart for the people in need. And James says quite clearly, that faith cannot save him. So when Protestants say we are saved by faith alone, it's obviously not that kind of faith. Rather, it is a working faith. It is a faith that God gifts his people. And Luther says, who gave us the doctrine of justification by faith alone after the church had corrupted so many things, he said, that faith alone that saves is a mighty working faith. Okay, so that's how we clear up James and Paul. James's faith alone is not the faith that Paul says justifies by faith alone. Rather, J Paul's faith alone is a mighty, working, invigorating faith. It's the faith that clothes the naked. It's a faith that feeds the hungry. It's a faith that bears up the wounds and sufferings. That faith does save. And that faith trusts in Christ and his work alone. Now, verse 34 Then, then, when is that? Well, look at verse 33. It's the time of judgment. It's the time when the age of believer and unbeliever is over, and that day is coming. Verse 33, and he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, You need to have been feeding. You need to have been clothing. You need to have been befriending. You need to have been healing. You need to have been clothing. You need to have been visiting. No, he does say that, but that's not what he says at first. Verse 34, come you who are blessed by my Father. How are you blessed by our Father, by Jesus' Father? You are blessed by our Father because you have been placed in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says that the church is blessed in heavenly places in Christ. That faith alone puts you in his Son, and Jesus is calling his blessed bride to him. And he says, come, you who are basically in Christ, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world before any of you were born in his unconditional election and favor when he deemed to place you in his son, those are the people whom he is calling. And then when he says, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. Verse 36, I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous answer him in verse 37, Lord, when did we see you hungry, fed, thirsty, stranger, naked, in prison? And verse 40, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Now, the church has struggled with this. And it has struggled with this in general terms those who are more liberal tend to go down 
this aisle. I don't want to give you guys a complex of going down this aisle. And the conservative theological church has tended to go down this aisle. And what are those two aisles? Well, let me, let me give you the left hand. This is what Karl Rahner, the great Roman Catholic theologian, perhaps the most famous theologian of the 20th century, he came up with a term called the anonymous Christian. And so here you could have, in Karl Rahner's term, you could have deliberate, proclaimed atheists who do social work for the marginalized. And then supposedly, when Jesus on that great day calls all humanity together and he brings the atheist before him and says, come into my heaven. And the atheist responds, Lord, when did I see you clothed? And Jesus says, when you've done this to the least of these, when you adopted the progressive politics of the left and gave away other people's money, you now therefore will shine in heaven. Or on a personal level even, when you help the individual with your resources, even though you didn't believe in God and therefore didn't believe in me, uh, you therefore were righteous and you were a Christian and you didn't even know it. That's called the anonymous Christian. And liberal theology? Uh, at the turn of the 20th century, Alfred Harnock, the great American theologian who studied overseas and came back and said Christianity is leading the ethical life. And so what does an ethical person do if that's all you have? What you become a big social gospel, a good news social news person. You take other people's money, you are supposed to take your own money, and you just give it away, and therefore you have fulfilled Jesus' command. Now, what do the conservatives tend to go down to? Well, they say, shockingly, what does the text say? Yes, the text says something. We're not talking about just reader's response literary theory. What do you feel the text says? Well, I think, oh, that's beautiful. What do you think the text says? Well, that's true, too. Anything's true. It's the reader's response theory. Our Bible study is free-floating, free association kind of thing. So, I think you get the point. Look at verse 40. And the king will answer the righteous who are perplexed. When, 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 when did we see you? The king will answer them. Truly I say to you, as you did it to the one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Hmm. You see, Jesus is not honing in on their lack of awareness as to who he is. The text is actually saying and focusing on their lack of awareness in doing works. They didn't realize that it was Jesus. Now there's another liberal path to take once they succumb to that textual element. And that is, oh, I see. So we're just conservative in our theology and we're going to give other people's money away and our money away too because Jesus is in all of them. That's where Jesus is. You need to go to the other side of the tracks. You need to go to the ghettos. You need to go here. You need to go there because that's where Jesus is. That's what Jesus said. When you did this to the hungry, the naked, the thirsty, the people in prison, you did it to me. And so the conservative conservative person who's leaning kind of left says, oh, I see, we just need to be progressive in our politics. Now, let me underscore something. I love politics, and I talk far more than I know. And if you know me, you know that. 
I'm not here to tell you progressive politics is wrong. I'm not here to tell you that conservative politics is right. I have my leanings. I'll be happy to talk to you about the pros and cons and how we take Christian principles to the best of our ability. I think believers can be in both camps. But here's what the text says regarding that other option. Okay? It's verse 40. I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you've done it to me. It's not indiscriminate giving to everybody and anybody. What Jesus is talking to is the righteous people who are in Christ, who are serving the righteous brothers and sisters who are suffering. They're in prison because of their faith. Paul was in prison because of his faith. And some forsook him. Some would not come and visit him. Some did. That's what this text is talking about. But we live in America. And we think we're suffering because we can't bake a cake for some and not others. Now, I'll grant you, I'm for religious freedom. But brothers and sisters, we're not suffering yet to this degree, to where this text has a lot of meaning. As believers, they were hungry because they were oppressed. They were thirsty because they were oppressed by an unbelieving world. They were strangers because they were dispersed and fleeing. And Hebrews says they were living in caves. Will your faith take you into caves? Will your faith take you when you no longer can be a lawyer because you believe in certain things? Will your faith take you when you're childless and you go to the adoption agency and they say, your views of homosexuality keep you from adopting kids because you have an oppressive, bigoted, homophobic mentality and you cannot adopt kids. That's going on in Canada right now. I was sick because I couldn't get access to things because I was a believer. I was in prison because I'm preaching a text and they said, you can't do that and we're going to lock you up. That's what this text is talking about. It's not talking about progressive or liberal politics for the mass of humanity. It's talking about the suffering brothers and sisters in Christ and what are you going to do? Are you going to stand by them? Those days are coming. Those days are here. And I don't know how far that will take us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand. Easy to confess here. But don't be disillusioned. This isn't a religious act only before that terrible God. You must continue to confess out there. And we may need to come and visit you. We may need to clothe you. We may need to give you shelter. Because the days may be coming when historic Christianity is not allowed. So, let's confess together. As easy as it is, though disturbing things are happening in our culture. The beginning of your songbook, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church. Saints. Please be seated. Now, I said we just are coming to the end of calendar year A in the liturgical layout of A, B, and C, year 1, 2, and 3. And we're coming to the end of Pentecost in calendar year A. And 
We have the Spirit now in total. Every believer in Jesus Christ is indwelt. The tabernacle is not needed. The tent of the meeting is not needed. The temple is not needed in all its glory. No, because we now are the temple. The Ark of the Covenant is an unfound archaeological prize. If someone can find it, wow, would they be rich, and wow, would that make the headlines, and I would like to see it too. But make no mistake, it's just a piece of gold right now. You are the Ark of the Covenant to this extent that He dwells in you. His presence is in you. You are the walking tabernacle and Ark of the Covenant of God Himself. And you have a privilege. While the priest, the high priest, once a year could only go in there, you have 24-7 access. No busy signals, no, uh, I'm driving, call me later. God is here. So take your concerns to him. He hears silence prayers. He hears aches and pains. And the Spirit himself understands you better than yourself and ushers prayers to God the Father. But for those who want to exercise a vocal community prayer in which we can join you, now is the time when there's sufficient silence, I will lead us in the Lord's Prayer, and you can pray that prayer with me out loud. But let's now go to him in prayer. Thank you for a place where your word is preached rightly and taught rightly, where your sacraments are administered rightly. I pray that this community and the state and this nation won't suffer the famine of your word. I pray that you will raise up men who will preach your word fearlessly. I pray for grace and the people that they will stand. For your word tells us that if we deny you before men, you will deny us before the Father. Only by grace can we stand. Just bless us in that. I perceive that things are not going to change in this country absent a revival in your church, and only you can grant that revival. You have chosen means to do that, and you tell us in your word that the means are what's called ordinary. They're only ordinary in that that's what we're called to do day in and day out. Preach rightly, teach rightly, administer the sacraments rightly. Obviously, they're extraordinary because that is the means you have chosen to use to convict sinners of sin, bring people to faith, and equip your saints for your work in the world. We just pray for a continued opportunity to be salt and light in this community um, and do that which you have called us to do. Thank you for getting us to this point. Please continue to bless us into the future. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom. Amen. And now we have a convenient time following the apostles who took up a collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem. The believers 
saved at the beginning of each week the blessings that God had blessed them with, and they took up this collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem. This is a following after that loose pattern. It's a small t tradition. It's a convenient time to support the work of this ministry if this is where you hang your hat. If you're visiting, if this isn't the church where you hang your hat, no compelling notion and just please just pass this plate to the next one and enjoy the worship of God through Christ.
Amen. Now, in case you didn't recognize the tune, not of the song that we just heard, but that terrible God is the same tune of the doxology, a tune which someone in Calvin's Geneva created. So now, yes, that terrible God can be the God whom we praise. Please stand and let's sing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Hey, please be seated. Now I took a soft shot at progressive politics. As Margaret Thatcher said, you know, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. <laughs> but I know some liberals that also give personally. I do. I know some orthodox, historic Christians who believe that there's a role for the government to help with the safety net. It's pretty hard to say no safety net and think in terms of where the rubber meets the road. Now, you can accuse me of fickle cell anemia, and it would probably stick. Um, but I will say that principles are a whole lot easier to find than they're difficult than application. And when Paul says to the Thessalonians, Give to those in need. Now, I, I, I want to play dumb here just so we don't miss it. That means digging into your pocket and giving to your brothers and sisters who are in need. And what that means is to be sensitive to the condition and state of your brothers and sisters. Now, I've seen some wonderful giving in this church over and beyond that little silver plate that gets passed around. And I am just happy to see it, because that's Christianity in action. That's making sure you don't get deceived by someone else, because you're giving it all, and you're looking for those whom Jesus says to be looking for. But make no mistake, Paul in Thessalonians says, give to those in need, comma, especially those in the household of faith. Now just follow the logic in that. Especially those in the household of faith, which means perhaps non-especially is assumed, which means all suffering people. So this text does not address that. The text in Matthew, it addresses the brothers and sisters who are suffering because of their courageous faith. But there are principles in Scripture that tell us to give beyond those in the household of faith. Now, if your philosophy is that should be personal, I would affirm that we should keep it as personal as we can without letting people die in the streets in some sort of a safety net. And I don't have the answers or the solutions. And some of you think much more clearly than I. And that's fine. But this text told us to help our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted. There are other texts that would say that our obligation clearly extends beyond our brothers and sisters, though our brothers and sisters ought to be our primary target. Francis Schaeffer, a prophet of the 20th century, an Orthodox Reformed person, had two critiques of the Christian Reformed Evangelical Church, and he said, there's not enough material sharing in our four walls. 
We've got the words of grace and theology, but we're negligent in caring for other people in the church. Now, he was speaking of the American church. And as I've said, I've seen some wonderful things in this church. And may we continue to care for one another, looking for the opportunity to take our talents and share them with those in need. Why is that? Because our Lord took his time, talents, and treasures and shared them with us. And in case you're missing the elephant in the room, he shared his very life. Few would die for a good man and even fewer for maybe a righteous man. But God gave his all to his enemies. That age is going to end one of these days. But that is the age we are in now. The warrior lamb is coming, but that's not the age we are in. So... The seeking shepherd is still seeking. Christ Reformed Presbyterian Church has a mandate to find the lost and to be the hands and the feet of our Lord and to find those sheep that have been scattered. On the night that our Lord was betrayed by one of his own, it says that he loved them even unto death. He took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. In the same way, he took the cup of blessing. And when he had given thanks, he poured the wine and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. And with those common words, with common elements, God is doing an extraordinary work. It's the work of his grace in his people. May I have a few elders to assist in the distribution, please. We have gluten-free wafers. They're the hard crackers. You will find them in the midst. Um, This is an open table, but it is a confessional table, which means this is not our table. It's not the Presbyterian table. It is the table of those who confess Jesus Christ as their Lord, who have seen the demand to give all, who have seen their only hope is what Christ has done for them. If that's you, then come and receive the promised presence of God in Christ's name. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. Christ's blood shed for you. The body of Christ given 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 for you. 
the body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ, Kurt, shed for you. The blood of Christ. Amen. So how can there be no fear in God's people when there's a command to give your all, there's a command to be ready now, there's a command to persevere, and a threat of judgment, and a threat of judgment, and a threat of judgment, because God knows that sin still resides in you and me. And those exhortations and those threats stir in the elect an awakening, a value-laden attitude, and I would even say an emotion that looks at the kingdom of God and God himself as a treasure that says, I'll sell everything I have. I must give my all because that he is my only and surest delight. You are more to be desired than gold and silver. Yea, David says, even than life itself. The elect, by his spirit, have seen the beauty of God. And therefore, all of those things, the elect go, yes, I'm falling short, but I will rise again. Yes, those warnings are there, but ah, I'm not destined for wrath. I'm in his son. If you think you're working yourself out of wrath, you've missed the whole boat. Are you in his son? Is Christianity about Christ? If it is, you have absolutely nothing to fear. Let's stand and sing number 65. The gates of beauty, his presence, are open. <coughs> now the gates of beauty, young, let me enter there. Where my soul in joyful duty waits for him who answers prayer. Oh, how blessed is this place, filled with solace, light, and grace. Gracious God, I come before thee, come thou also unto me. Where we find thee and adore thee. Verse 5 Speak, O God, and I will hear thee. Let thy will be done today. May I undisturbed draw near thee while thou dost thy people feed. Balm 
for all your woes. Well, if you're young, you may not even understand what that means. But I think you'll get this. And if you don't get it, watch a newborn baby. Look at the face of mom, who's perhaps feeding them. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in the name of the Lord. Amen. There's goodies over here and drugs. I mean by that caffeine, just in case I'm confusing people. Hey, dude. Hey. How big a crew do you have here? Thanksgiving.